Okay, cool. Um, I'll start now. Hey guys, um, thank you for attending today. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, fortunately, my laptop's broken at the moment, so that's why you're getting just a boring black and white picture. I mean, I do apologize. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, as the talk goes on, you think of your questions, please do type them into the chat section. I'll be making a note of those. And at the end of the talk, we'll have a Q&A session with Stuart about you know, the questions that have come to mind as we've gone through this talk. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to take up any more time because, you know, time is precious. So I'm going to hand it straight to you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Cheers, Anthony. So firstly, thank you, everybody, for joining. So just very quickly, I just wanted to, for those that don't know me, um, so... I'm Stuart Day. I'm the uh, head of uh, quality at Dunelm uh, Soft Furnishings. Um, I've worked in software delivery and quality testing side of things for around about 23 years. I say around about, it was actually 23 years anniversary last week. Um, so that doesn't make me feel old at all. Um, that's within the airline, e-commerce, retail, banking industry. So I've got a, a good mix of kind of experience. Um, been agile for over 10 years. That doesn't mean I can touch my toes because that's kind of going away as well every day. Um, advocate of quality first and quality engineering. Um, I'm a quality coach and mentor. Um, I, I speak at meetups, facilitate and organize meetups as well. I'm one of the co-hosts of Ministry of Testing Essentials in the Midlands. Um, I'm also a certified agile coach and agile team facilitator. Um, and by the t-shirt, you can see I'm a big Back to the Future fan. Okay, so... Without further ado, we're going to uh, crack on. So we, the, the title of this talk is The Future of Testing and How Can We Be Prepared? Um, and powering this talk will be the flux capacitor. So you will already see that there's a theme going on. OK, so you all get back to the future fans out there. Um, we'll, we'll kind of know, uh, catch on to some of these things as we go through. If you haven't seen Back to the Future, highly recommend you do. Um, so firstly, what I want to do is I want to talk about how things have changed over time. So as I mentioned, I've been in the industry for uh, 23 years. Um, and like a lot of people, actually, um, I kind of just fell into testing and quality. Um, so what I want to do is I, I want to take us back. So we're going to look at the tech, tech almanac, OK? So I want to take us back to 1st of September, 1997, at 9 o'clock in the morning, OK? So this was the first role. I'd, I'd been out of college for a year. I'd been, I'd done a, a role a, um, around being a systems administrator for a company on a, on a youth training scheme, which didn't quite work out very well. Um, and I was out of work for a little bit. And I found this role being advertised in, um, in, in the window of a, a recruitment agency in our, in our local town. Um, and it was for a UAT analyst. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Read the description, thought, yeah, I could, I could do that. that. Applied and got the role. Didn't really know what a UAT analyst was, to be fair. Um, so turned up on the, my first day, jumped on public transport with my bus timetable in my bag, um, got, got to the office and I was a bit like, mm, okay, so what is this role? Didn't really have a clue around what testing was, didn't really have a clue about what UAT was. Um, but what a, this was my intro into a lot of you know, where I am today. Um, and, and I was at this organization for 30, 13 years. Um, I learned my trade there, but also you know, um, I progressed in through a number of different roles. And over that time, technology changed massively. So the company that I worked for was a company called OAG. Um, and they were, uh, and they're still around now, they, they, they uh, publish airline schedules um, and do a lot of other, other things as well now, but they're, they're big in the airline scheduling industry. Um, and the day I um, started there, some of the tech that we were using was, well, some people may not even recognize some of the tech that I've got on this slide right now. The, you know, the, the technology, we, 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 were, um, we had a, an IBM AS400 mainframe um, big old thing, you know, uh, we had green screen VDUs. Um, I remember it was only the, the, the um, supervisors at the time that had a PC. So if you wanted to do anything on a PC, you had to go and speak to the supervisor to actually be able to do that. Um, and the, the primary focus then was very much around printing these, um, these guides here, the flight guide, the world, worldwide flight guide. Um, 
and uh, we, we often had to look at printouts and we were utilizing things like these line printers. And I remember printing out these documents and having to go through line by line, you know, check it to make sure that the, the content of the thing was right and, you know, marking where it was wrong and all this kind of thing. But one of the things that um, for me, what, joining this organization was I, I trained up very, very um, for the first few weeks, couple of months, really around the systems and the, and the technology they were using. But I still didn't really have a, a, a real good idea of what you know, a UAT analyst was or what testing really was. Um, and gradually, obviously, um, that kind of became a bit more of a, a self-learn thing. Um, you know, we, we um, often pull people in from, from within the organization, um, which really kind of, you know, obviously didn't get knowledge in from the outside, but we learn our trade internally and kind of worked on, on what was best for us. So, you know, you're looking at technologies here that, you know, uh, you know these would be great in a museum nowadays. Um, there's a fax machine here. If anybody hasn't had seen a fax machine, well, I believe Messi uses one. Um, there's a fax machine. Um, you know, there's a desktop phone. Wow. Um, and, you know, as, as 13 years was a long time to be in this, this, this company. So technology obviously moved on, but it still, it still was quite limited, to be fair, in terms of how much technology as a, as a company we were kind of targeting and what our customers were using. Um, we had some PDA devices where we were uploading um, timetable information to um, one of the very first, well, potentially one of the very first smartphones um it was the the spv where we were looking at how we could do sms alerting for flight status information and that kind of stuff um but even then you know the technology didn't seem to be especially for our customers didn't seem to move on that quickly um so you know it was 13 years where things within this organization stood quite still in terms of tech um and obviously i continued to learn my trade there and our ways of working were very very well, what we class nowadays as legacy. Um, I mean, to be fair, when I when I was there, I didn't even really know that we were doing waterfall. I didn't know what waterfall really was when I started. Um, it was only over time we kind of obviously realized how we were working. Um, everything was was manual. Everything was testing. It was you know um, manual testing. You know, even even to the point of you know if we wanted to test something performance related, we'd get a stopwatch out and we we we'd see how long it takes to load a file or you know, run, run, a, run a test or you know, that kind of thing. Um, and the big thing, obviously, you know, we were always, always being squeezed for time uh, in terms of how, you know, these big projects, um, you know, the, that we would invest time and money in and always end up having to squeeze time at the end to make sure that, you know, we, we did enough testing um, to make sure we hit a deadline. Um, I think one of the projects we worked on, um, was quoted to be two years. It ended up being five years. That was a replatform to come off the mainframe. You know, those kind of things were really, really evident back then. Um, and, you know, in terms of our ways of working, they didn't really evolve hugely. You know, we had big specification documents. Um, everything was kind of handoffs. One of the things that did play to our advantage was we had our IT team was quite small. So even though you know, we did have these handoffs and we worked in this way, we were able to speak to our developers if we chose to. Um, and obviously, you know, because the team was small, it was easier to kind of communicate in that way. But it was very much, you know, we were still classed as the gatekeepers of quality, even throughout that whole 13 year period that I was there. Um, and, you know, we, we, we kind of looked at and tried to work a bit more collaboratively in, in some ways, but it didn't quite, you know, um, evolve as quickly as potentially things evolve nowadays. Um, but the one thing, obviously, you can see there as well, we, we, even though we were working in this way, we did still use post-its. So we were quite advanced with post-its, right? Because everybody uses post-its, still do. Um, so what I want to do is just jump forward very, very quickly now um, to um, August, I think it was August 23rd. I mean, James, who's on the call, who was my manager at this time, may, may be able to correct me on this, but I think it was around about that time, August 23rd, 2010, when I joined EasyJet. Um, and the reason I joined EasyJet was very much because 
as I mentioned previously, the, 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 the technology and the ways of working weren't evolving very quickly um, within the organization that I was working with. And outside, I was very aware that things were moving forward. Um, and I obviously had a new people in the industry of testing and software development. And you know, the, 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 the talk then was all around agile and you know, uh, this is the great new thing and, and you know, how quickly technology was moving along. And I needed to make a decision in terms of, okay, do I stay where I am? Because I was in a test manager's role. I was literally five minutes walk away from my house as well, which was always very nice. Um, or do I take take the you know the challenge and, and you know almost take um, a, a kind of a, a step back in terms of become a test analyst to relearn my trade, um, but also step out of my comfort zone. So I was still in the airline industry, but moving into an e-commerce world. Now, one of the things you know, if if you're a Back to the Future fan. You know, around about this time, we would have been expecting things like hoverboards and, and flying cars. But no, unfortunately, that wasn't the case at all. Um, I had to drive to work. I did have a car by then, which was lovely. Um, but I still had to drive to work. And yeah, the best thing I think I had, I, I had an old skateboard, but yeah, never rode it. Um, so coming into EasyJet was a real eye opener for me. And um, you know, the technologies that we were sort of facing into over, and I was at EasyJet roughly around almost four years. Um, and it was really eye-opening to me in terms of, you know, the technology um, over that time and how technology changed um, and, and how ways of working kind of evolved and how, how different they were from what I'd been used to for, for, for 13 years. Um, so coming into EasyJet, um, you know, you, and, and can I just say, if you've never worked for an airline, work for an airline, you know, I know they've not had a great time of it over the last X amount of months with everything that's been going on, but it is a really great place, you know, great opportunity to, um, to work um, because it, it really kind of opens up your eyes to a number of things. Um, you know, we, we, we had to face into, you know, a number of different technologies um, and, you know, we were obviously, you know, the, the primary thing is all around flight reservations and booking online and making sure our passengers get into the air on time. Um, and, you know, we, we, over time, we had to face into things like, you know, the, the um, mobile phones. We, we um, obviously facing into um, the you know, different browsers, which I, I wasn't used to from necessarily from, from the time I spent with OAG. It was, that was very much, you know, um, different types of, of applications and, and, um, technologies we were using there but they weren't really customer facing in this way so it was a really kind of eye-opener for me in terms of how we would approach things um, and also you know the, the potential risk of you know um, issues going through into our production environments um, so you know we, we kind of looked at things like um, uh, you know obviously the boarding passes um, we, we implemented um, allocated seating the easy to get allocated seating um, and, and Steve and James who are on, on this call right now, we know all about the, the fun we had with that. Um, you know, we all faced into mobile apps, you know, the, the EasyJet app launched during that time as well. Um, and also, you know, cloud. So we, we, as part of the allocated seating project, we, we invested and, in, in, in moved that piece of uh, functionality into Azure cloud as well. Um, so all these things started to, started to take shape. Um, and, you know, we, we, Whereas I was saying we were doing things um, very manually um, at um, OEG when I was there, um, things were moving on at EasyJet. So we were looking at more automated means of, of doing things. So automated testing, um, we had you know, more robust performance testing that we were, would do via third parties that were formed you know, part of our day to day or our sprint to sprint. Um, and, you know, everybody loves Jira, right? So we were, we were using, you know, Jira as well. Um, that was tongue in cheek, by the way, if anybody didn't get that. Uh, so, you know, we, we were kind of, you know, it was, it was really great to kind of be working in different ways with, with different technologies. In terms of our ways of working, um, we were um, working in, in, in um, utilizing Scrum. So we were working in sprints. Um, we had our, our, our board set up. Uh, we were using user stories for, for um, determining what it was that we wanted to, to, to deliver. Um, we started looking at things like BDD. And this was where I first came in contact with BDD. 
I think, you know, all the, the learnings I took from what we did at, uh, at EasyJet from the start of, of looking at BDD, you know, obviously we we kind of probably got it wrong to start with because we were very much looking at utilizing BDD as an automation mechanism rather than the collaborative mechanism. Um, and, you know, but they're, they're all lessons learned and they're great lessons. Um, it was a much more collaborative environment. Um, we still did have the, the kind of the devs dev and the, the testers tested kind of approach, um, but it was a much more collaborative environment because we were working in, in, in you know, uh, in Scrum. So we talked more, we sat at the same desk, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we did invest, as I mentioned, we did invest in, in, in automation. Um, but again, it was very UI driven. A lot of what we did then was very focused at the UI, um, not so much at the unit test level, um, but it was really great to kind of be working somewhere that was trying to do these things and, and learn from them as well. Um, and, 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 you know, we, we were looking at things like how we did more exploratory testing and, you know, regression and, you know, uh, performance and, you know, as I mentioned before, but we, we were still kind of, uh, pretty much the gatekeepers of the quality. So, you know, we would sign something off after, you know, the sprint to make sure all the teams are happy. We would sign stuff off at the end of a, um, a regression to make sure we could release. And actually our, our release processes were still very manual as well. So, you know, our releases would be um, from 10 p.m., I think roughly 10 p.m. to like 4 a.m. Um, on a particular evening. And we'd have to take all our systems down, including our reservation system, we, and deploy everything because we had big monoliths, um, and then bring it all back up. And I remember, like you know, some some evenings we'd be still we'd kind of overrun, and we'd be looking out the 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 hangar window into the car park and seeing customers turning up at the airport ready for the first wave of check-in, and we still hadn't got the reservation system back up. And that's that's quite pressure, um, quite a lot of pressure to be to be under on during a during a release. Um, so things were, you know, whilst, whilst, um, you know, obviously we were, we were moving in directions still, sometimes it felt like we were kind of moving a little bit slower. Sprints were three weeks. We then did kind of one to two weeks regression on some stuff because there was so much to do. That's why we tried to invest in automation, which did speed things up, but then we had a lot of maintenance around those things as well. Um, and I, I say, I was there for, for, for about four years. Oh, also guess what? We used post-its. Um, so I was there for around about four years and then um, moved on somewhere else. But what I want to do is I want to bring you more to the, the, the now. So how so if you look at how technology and, and ways of working have kind, kind of evolved from back in 1997 um, to what I'm showing you here now, which was between 2010 and 2014, you can see that there was a lot of change, more technologies coming in, more things to think about from a quality perspective. And as testers, you know, trying to learn new things, learn new trades, you know, really understand our engineering uh, processes and stuff more and more. Um, and the other thing to think about is, you know, you'll see here on, on this slide is that, you know, the, the, the Kanban type board that we've got here is very much testing was still a phase that we did. Um, and it was often even, even through the sprints squeezed towards the end. So um, let's just fast forward now to, um, oh, guess what? Today, 7th of September, 2020 at 12.20. Well, I'm not too far off. Um, so what, is, what does it look like? So a lot of things have changed in, you know, in this time. So from 2014 to now, which is only six years, um, that's a good job I'm good at maths because that would have looked embarrassing. Um, you know, there's a hell of a lot of things that have changed. I mean, the, the last few months, things have changed massively anyway. Um, you know, there's a, we're all working more remotely, so therefore we're more reliant on remote technology. Um, it's kind of impacted our ways of working, our ways of thinking. Um, and as, as QAs and as, as testers, um, obviously, again, we've had to adapt. We've had to kind of, we, you know, for, for, um, people that the teams that are used to sitting next to each other and talking we've now got to think about how can we continue those collaborative ways of working um through different means and you know things like serverless technology you know is such a such a big thing now um, and the cloud is such a big thing now that you know all these things kind of just uh, you know are, are, are quite mind-blowing in terms of how far we've come in in you know times or, you know in the last six years or so um 
So if, if we look at, at what we're doing at Dunelm at the moment, in terms of the technologies we're using. So uh, you know, this, is, uh, this is a messy slide, right? But I just wanted to kind of give you an example of all the different types of technologies we're using currently um, at Dunelm and they all have their uses, right? So we're not, uh, we are trying to phase some stuff out. Uh, as you can see, we still use SAP. Um, so, you know, that's something that is, is a big, piece of our architecture, our legacy architecture, but it's fun, it's fundamental to it, pretty much everything that we're doing right now. Um, so we are looking at how we kind of come away from SAP moving forward um, and, you know, become more aligned to, uh, you know, how we built our digital platform, which is serverless technology, microservice, um, all up in the cloud, or, you know, all auto scaling, you know, we, we're invested in, you know, um, Fastly as our CDN capability, you know, we've built our, our applications in Node, React. Um, you know, we, we've um, spent a lot of time um, with um, using using Jenkins and, and well, what will be GitLab very soon to, to you know, build our pipelines and, and things like that. But obviously, we've still got the challenges of mobiles. We've still got the challenges of browsers. Interestingly, things have changed with, from a browser perspective, whereas I think before it was very much does it function in a browser whereas now a lot of the browsers are built on the same um, underlying technology and therefore functional testing within browsers is probably less important whereas visual becomes a much more um, kind of go-to thing these days around you know does it visually look correct in all these browsers and how quickly can I do that um, obviously, you know, Slack for communication, we're looking at utilizing Pact for contract testing. You know, one of the things that, you know, is thrown up at us is that you know, being in the world of microservices, it becomes very challenging to, whilst they're, they're, in, you know, they're, depend, they're independent to, to a degree, um, it does cause many problems in the sense of how do we test them from an integration perspective um, and ensure that you know they are talking to each other correctly. You're getting the right responses back, um, and you know that's one thing we we replatformed at Dunelm back in uh, October last year, and it was about an eighteen month project. Um, excuse me. And one of the things when I rejoined Dunelm um, beginning of last year, we were kind of in this midst of oh, we need to do these big end-to-end -end tests of all our applications because we haven't really done anything from an integration perspective to give us confidence. Um, and it kind of reminded me going, going back, you know, several years of doing those big end-to-end -end tests for monolith systems that you couldn't really get away from. Whereas we built an application uh, uh, and you know, built our architecture to enable us to test more frequently, faster feedback, those kind of things, but we hadn't utilized it in that way. So we'd really drop the ball around testability um, and you know, whether it's gonna perform um, correctly you know, for, for the, the, vo the volumes of customers that we, we had coming on board, you know, those kind of things. So all this stuff was still very much left towards the end of the, of the delivery, even though we, we got the architecture there to do it much sooner. So, um, if I just jump forward to kind of how we work at, at Dunelm. So one of the things with com me coming back to Dunelm, whilst we were doing some good stuff in the quality space, there was still this air of devs dev, testers tested. Um, even though the engineers were, were more involved and they were more aware of, um, more aware of the, the, the need for quality, let's put it that way. Um, it, it was still very difficult to kind of get them aligned in terms of getting them to you know, be part of the testing and um, think about you know, automation, um, but not automate everything, automate what you need to automate, utilizing exploratory testing more, you know, those kind of things. Um, and over the, last, um, over the last 18 months or so, we've really, really focused on trying to build the, the um, a, cult, a culture of quality, if you like. So thinking about quality first, um, really kind of, you know, um, looking at how our engineers and our, our, our QAs pair up more, you know, test early, you know, all that, that kind of good shift left stuff that you hear about, which actually is really difficult to achieve because it's not just about technology that's going to get you there. It's about the mindset and the ways of working. 
Whereas before we were very much, you know, in, in the all, all, pretty much all the organizations that I'd worked in before, it was very much QA was pretty much the gatekeeper. They'd always have the final say as to whether something was going to be released. What we've been trying to get to here is not about, you know, um, having gatekeepers, but having, you know, team ownership around quality um, and focus on prevention of issues rather than, you know, finding them and fixing them later down the food chain. Now, you know, I remember conversations, you know, the, the, that, that great feeling when, when, you know, when you're, a, when you're a tester or a QA and you, you find a bug and you tell, the, and, you, know, you, you tell the developer and it's like, guess what I found? A big smile on your face just to look at the reaction of the developer. Um, we've all been there. You know, we've all gone, how many bugs have you found? Um, and, you know, it was, it was always, it was, it was a nice warm feeling. But when I look back at it, it's kind of like, that's probably not the best, best kind of experience for anybody that's, you know, now starting out, they shouldn't be thinking in, the, in those ways. Um, and the, you know, we really need to think about having empathy for, you know, our engineering, engineering need to think and have empathy for, you know, what we do in the quality space. Um, and we need to work more, you know, um, more in unison in terms of, you know, bringing these things together and really focusing on building the quality in as we go rather than you know, you know assessing a quality you know, through testing or, or checks the you know, automated checks and things like that um, and, and and it's been quite it's, it's been really interesting to see you know some some engineers and some of the QAs have really kind of just done this naturally others have been a little bit taking a little bit more time some still wrap their arms around it and say no testing's my role you know, you know don't, don't take that away from me but it's not really about taking anything away from anyone it's really trying about be you know, um, building those cross-functional T-shaped um, teams uh, or people within cross-functional teams. So I've seen things like questions going around on LinkedIn and Twitter about, you know, what would you do if you're the only the only tester in a in a cross-functional team? Well, to start with, you should never be the only tester if your team is truly cross-functional. So you know, the idea of a cross-functional team is everybody will can assist in all these different areas. You may not be the specialist but you are able to pick up some testing or you can pair with your engineer and understand coding and, you know, understand engineering practices. Um, so, you know, we're, we're practicing, obviously, you know, really focusing on quality first, you know, um, utilizing BDD for collaboration um, up front. Um, you know, we have, we've invested heavily in, in, in DevOps as a, as a, as a culture um, and obviously through, through the DevOps, um, uh, you know, the DevOps mechanism, if you like, um, you know, you can basically test the whole, you know, every single point. Um, we've invested a lot of time and money into, you know, our continuous integration, delivery and deployment. Um, and it's really been that way as well, because we, we've, um, you know, we've, we've kind of gone, we've, we've taken that slow. Uh, and one of the other things I kind of said to the guys when, when I returned was, I think we're trying to go too fast. Um, we were trying to chase continuous deployment when, to be honest, we were nowhere near ready. We didn't have the, the quality, you know, to, 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 to push that out. We didn't have the automation in place to really do those verification checks. We didn't even have the upfront collaboration that, that really kind of would, would bed, embed the, the quality upfront, you know, through, through the discussions we were having and those kind of things. Um, so we've kind of grown into that. And, and, you know, obviously that's created different opportunities, different challenges in terms of, you know, how how we need to think about things from a quality and, and testing perspective who's doing it um and you know obviously kind of letting go a little bit to to think you know i'm not here to to raise bugs find bugs i'm here to work collaboratively to prevent these things and build quality in um and you know actually we're at the point where you know our our, our qas are very much so well we want our engineers to test whereas before we would be like no, testing is my thing. Not everybody can do testing. Well, in, in today's society, pretty much anybody can do testing. They may not be a specialist, but you know they can do it. And actually, we should be open to that. Um, so you know, we've we've looked at how we build performance into our pipelines. Whereas I mentioned when I was at EasyJet, we used to do um, performance testing every sprint, but it was very, it was kind of separate, and we, we it, because of the application, it was very. Um, troublesome sometimes and you know we've got the results late and it was challenging and anybody that's done any work in performance will know 
if you find an issue with performance, with load or, or scalability, they are always the hardest things to analyze and unpick. Um, so you don't really want to be hitting them towards the end of a delivery. You want to be kind of facing into those things as early as possible. Um, so, you know, we, we, we're trying to kind of look at how we do things. You know, um, I'm not going to use the term best practice because I, I don't believe in the term best practice. I think, you know, the practices we undertake evolve constantly. So what may be classed as best practice today, next week will be out the window. So, you know, it's more around, you know, um, that continuous improvement. Um, we've, got a, we've got a goal we're going after. How do we achieve that goal? Um, and, you know, the quality, the culture of quality is very much the, at the center of that. So just kind of, that's kind of, um, how, you know, I want to give you an idea of, from, from my own personal experiences, right, how things have, have changed and through my eyes, you know, where things have evolved and, you know, um, where they've not evolved. I mean, look, guess what? We still use posters, you know, so I said something there. Um, but, you know, I think everybody, yeah, everybody's kind of will, will view this differently. Everybody will have different experiences. You know, um, I you know I've learned in my short period as, as doing some contracting. I learned a lot from banking and how teams are working and and, and so on as well. Um, so, I guess what what may the future hold? So, if one thing Back to the Future Two kind of showed us was it's pretty hard to predict the future. Um, so we got some stuff right. So you can see here that you know um, Marty's son was was able to watch videos through his glasses. Well, Google Glass came out, wasn't overly successful, but yeah, we've got facial recognition, we've got three D films. Again, three D films, you know, uh, depending on whether you're a film buff, you you like them or hate them. Uh, but we haven't got flying cars, uh, and you know, I think you know everybody that, that was the one thing that everybody was really excited about. The, the self-lacing shoes as well. I mean, my daughter would love them right now because she's trying to learn how to tie her shoes right now. So she's, if she sees this film, she'll be really disappointed. Um, and the hoverboard. I mean, the hoverboard is a great example of designing something without no, really knowing how your customer is going to use it. Who knew that you couldn't go over a lake in the hoverboard, right? There you go. Um, so in terms of technology, uh, you know, I think, and, and this, again, this is just kind of my take on this. Um, and you can take what you want. You can, you know, obviously um, question me around some of these things. But my view is that obviously that there is going to be more cloud and serverless tech, right? Um, I think that's a given. Um, I think we're going to see more and more infrastructure as code as well. So we're going to go move away from the, you know, the, the manual configuration stuff and we start using Terraform and Kubernetes and those kind of things more and more. Um, I think AI and AR will continue to grow. I don't. It's difficult to say how quickly, especially AI. AI is always an interesting one, and a lot of the the, the discussions. You know, I've been on some discussions where around. You know, um, will AI replace testing? Well, it, probably not. And you know, it's got to be very, very advanced to really think for itself. And in in that way, the human brain and utilizing your own experiences is, is you know far going to be far greater than AI at its present state. Maybe in many, many years time, there might be something that comes close, but you know, I don't think it's ever gonna replace you know, the need for people to, to physically test something. Um, there will be, there's gonna be more and more automation. Okay, and I think it, that, that will drive and be at the center of, of the success of a lot of organizations. But on, on the other hand, manual testing what, what is, is not gonna die. Um, remember, automation is only as good as what you're telling it to do anyway. Um, so, you know, you've got to think about those things. You've got to assess the risk. You've got to understand what you need to automate. Um, and that's where AI may come in, in terms of helping to, you know, what should I automate based on this, that, and the other. But for me, the biggest, the real big benefit of automation, and I've had this conversation with so many of our engineers, is actually it frees you up to do more and more exploratory testing. And exploratory testing is a manual process that you know is is, is so valuable because you're, you know, you wish you've got time to do it. it really helps you understand your product um, and explore your product and and you know think about how will you know if you if you've taken time to understand your customers then you'll you, it's a great way of really understanding the product and, and to, as to whether it will meet their needs. Um, 
more uh, and I think there's going to be a lot more self-serve technology so I mean you know um, obviously the, the, you know, the, the serverless side of things and uh, is very much helps organizations basically just go well we'll you know scales itself and you know we'll use what we need and we won't where we won't and you know that's very much self-serve but again we like the things we like we're seeing around you know um amazon you know releasing their their new store concepts of i can't remember what they're called now but you know going in there serving yourself coming out not having to really speak to anybody i mean sometimes that's great but i think you know it's nice to especially being in lockdown for so long it's very nice to actually speak to some people face to face on occasions um so i think you know for, for, from my perspective Technology is going to is going to is going to shift. Obviously, we saw how quickly, or we've seen how quickly technology has kind of shaped over you know the, the timelines of events. Now, I went from a thirteen year stint in one organisation where technology didn't really evolve massively, but then that's product probably more so around our customer base um, and what our customer needs and 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 what was happening in, the, in that side of the industry went to EasyJet and things were moving, they moved more rapidly, we were looking at more technologies, you know, the, the, the mobile boarding pass, the app, you know, all those kind of things. Um, and actually, that was quite a short space of time in which we delivered a lot of those things. And then fast forward to now, you know, we, we're using a whole host of technologies to basically help us along our ways, it makes engineer technology makes engineering quicker, easier, you know, more self sufficient, you know, those kind of things as well. What about ways of working? So ways of working, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think you know, in the future, everyone will test. Not necessarily everyone will be a specialist, okay? And I think within, you know, within our industry, we really need to kind of take a step back and sometimes remove ourselves from you know, um, the, the common thing around, well, not everybody can test, right? You need to be uh, a specialist to do this. You need to... To, there, in, there is some truth in that, but I think in today's society, in terms of how teams work, in terms of the agile practices, you know, the collaboration, you know, that 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 kind of way of working, I think we need to open ourselves up to say yes, we should be encouraging everyone to test because everyone is responsible for the quality of the product we're putting out. You can't you can't say people need to own the quality if they're not if we're then going to say well you can't you can't do this bit because you know, that's our job um and you know i think you know our engineers are very very good at that now and actually our our qas are starting to pick up engineering type tasks as well because they're you know they're pairing a lot more understanding the code a lot more and so on and so on so we're really trying to at don't know at the moment we're trying to blur the lines um between the engineering and, and the quality space it's never good there's always going to be a you know the two things but it's really trying to bring them more together we've got other teams away uh, who are less mature and not you know just starting on that journey where we still got a lot of manual testing happening um and it's very much done you know dev test kind of, uh, of approach so you know we've got a lot to go through and still and still learn so you know it's going to be really interesting to see how that shapes up speed and agility will become even more important so that means you know shifting left more but also shifting right and really understanding our customers. Now, if, if we want to, if we want to deliver quickly, we need to understand what we need to deliver. And a great way to understand what we need to deliver is to understand our customer, right? So if we can understand our customer, then that helps when we're talking down this, this side of the process. Um, and when I say shift more left, you know, it's not just about CICD, it's about everything we do before we push code or we, we put a PR in um, and merge that code in, right? So the conversations we have, how we clarify our tickets, what, you know, what testing do we do before we, we do, you know, we, we, um, we, we put those PRs in, you know, what demos are we doing and what, co what um, code reviews are we doing with our engineers and our, um, and, you know, our, 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 our QAs, you know, how are they, how are they working? Uh, quality will be front and center. So, and I say this because customers just, they're going to be less patient because they've got so many options right i mean you look at banking you know how monzo come along and, and change the shape of banking and you know you've just got options out there now that you can just switch to different um providers or you know um uh, 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 sales teams or whatever really really quickly and and you know 
So we've really got to be thinking more around quality, but as you know, then we've got point two, which is speed and agility. So how do we deliver quality at speed? You know, so these are the things we need to think about more. Um, Cross-functional teams with T-shaped members uh, will we'll just naturally need to increase, I think. Uh, you know, we need to kind of broaden, get a much bigger breadth of knowledge uh, around these things. So we understand technology more, or have more empathy for engineering, you know, but don't lose sight of you know, where your specialism is. And if your specialism is very much in the testing space, you, know, you, you know, um, go deeper into certain, certain type, insert that to that area as well. So think about more around, you know, the, the breadth of, of the testing spectrum. So you think about performance, security, you know, accessibility, all these things that maybe you've never done before will start playing more and more into, into the, you know, into the, into the space. Um, and then I think uh, as we kind of build more and more self-managing teams, the role of test leads and managers will, will naturally just need to evolve or the, the risk is that it will just, it will fade away. Um, and I think, you know, what, the reason I say that is because what we're trying to do uh, at Dunnell, for example, is very much lead from within the team. So, you know, put the autonomy to the team. Um, yes, we have strategy. Yes, we have you know, a, 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 a continuous um, improvements roadmap for, for our chapter and things like that. But how they go about delivering that, how they go about assessing whether they're successful or not is really, is for the team to determine. So it's, it's those kind of things that you need to start really thinking about around ways of working. But I think there's one thing that we can all guarantee. Um, and that's the, guess what? We'll still have post-its because post-its never die. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. Um, so, how can we prepare? So, firstly, we need to have a growth mindset. Okay, so we need to be thinking, you know, um, look at these challenges or opportunities, you know, really kind of step into this, really self learn, you know, um, don't be scared of failure, acknowledge and embrace where you feel as though you need to learn and, you know, don't, don't shy away from it. Um, it just just utilize failure as an opportunity to, 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 to grow your, your, your learnings and grow your, your experience. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we also need to think about, you know, looking at um, rather than necessarily saying, oh, you know, developers are X, maybe start having a bit of empathy for them and really thinking about, you know, understanding their trade and vice versa, uh, enabling them to understand our trade. Um, and not just engineers, you know, our POs, our, our scrum masters, our BAs, you know, our, our, our customers. Um, but we really need to grow, you know, have that growth mindset to really evolve and continue to develop. Um, we can't be stuck in our old ways. We can't be talking about how many defects have we raised, how many, you know, assessing quality on, on defects. Um, I'll give you an example, right? I, I don't encourage defects to be raised in a sprint. I, I try and encourage the guys, don't raise a defect, have a chat about it and get it fixed. Because actually, if you've done your upfront um, collaboration, everything should be detailed in your story. And if you're telling me that something's not working based on the story, that's your, your, your conversation right there. Um, rather than going away and raising a defect and you know, taking the time to do that and, and going through that whole cycle. Some teams have adopted it, others haven't. We've done away with bug boards and things like that. Um, but you know, it's those kind of just innovative kind of ways of thinking that may just make the difference in, in your teams. Um, it won't work for everybody, trust me, but just try it. Just think differently, think outside the box. And then don't, don't fade away. Okay. So there's a lot of people that are very much concerned around, you know, um, you know, do I need to learn automation? Do I need to? Yes. Yeah. In my opinion, yes, but think of it a bit more logically, right? Become the flux capacitor of quality, okay? So you remember back in back to the future where flux capacitor makes time travel possible. Everything centers around it. You become that person within the industry, right? Within your team. So think about being a quality advocate. Focus on quality engineering, okay? So understand engineering practices. Um, don't, just, don't just worry about automation. Automation is part of that. But if you don't really understand engineering practices, it's very difficult to engage and, and, and have empathy for your engineers. Widen your breadth, you know, uh, your breadth of testing and tech knowledge. Tech 
we've seen it moves at a fast pace. Anybody working in tech can't assume that their role between within a five year period is not going to have to evolve or how they, they think because tech changes so quickly. So, you know, don't think that you're doing a role now that in five years time is going to be safe because of X. No, just, just always think about evolution. Um, collaboration. So think about how you build quality in. So as being that advocate, build quality in. Um, coaching. So I mentioned before around, you know, test leads and, and managers. This is so important. I, I can't recommend highly enough, um, you know, becoming a qualified coach, having a coach and being a coach. It, it's so rewarding um, on, on both ends, but also so, so valuable because, you know, coaching quality into an organization is really where test managers and test leads, you know, I, I see them kind of becoming, you know, the, the, those kind of roles. Um, I've, I've mentioned the engineering thing, cloud technology, for obvious reasons, just, just get your head into it, get an understanding of it. There's plenty of um, courses out there to do that. Keep up to date with tech and ways of working. There's no reason nobody should be able to do this these days. I mean, great meetups like, like this one. You know, there's so many out there that you can just jump on in a lunchtime and learn. I mean, I wish I had that back in 1997 when I didn't have a clue about what I could hardly spell testing, let alone know what it really was. Um, and just always focus on you know, innovation and, and how you can evolve. Don't be scared to change. Don't be scared to innovate and, and, and try something different. And finally, I just want to say how personally, why I think we are so privileged um, to work in these roles. It's very rare you'll have a role where you're, you need to, your breadth of knowledge needs to be so great that actually it could take you in so many different directions, right? So here we've got a flux capacitor, as I mentioned, that's, that's you guys there in your teams. But you're learning so much about coaching. You're learning about performance engineering. You're learning about engineering, DevOps, Scrum Mastering, business analytics, because you, you liaise with them day in, day out. You're, you're, you're there to kind of help them as much as they are to help you. But also what you're gaining is you're gaining a raft of knowledge and a raft of experience that you can basically take anywhere. You know, it's, it's a really, we are really privileged and we should think about that. You know, I've done, you know, a lot of, um, I've recently I've done a lot of coaching and I love it. It's, it's great, but I'm still coaching in the quality space. It doesn't need to be different. You, know, you don't need to go and be, you know, I just coach agile. You can coach so many different things. So, you know, we are really privileged and, you know, I just don't want people to forget that and, and be concerned about some of the things I've said, you know, there, there's opportunities out there for, for if you just want to go out and grasp them and, you know, even within the quality space itself. So that's me. Hopefully that's, um, been good i don't know but i'll open it up to questions thank you very much Stuart. um okay we've got quite a selection of questions i'll get through as many as possible just bear me one minute i scroll up in the chat um where we're sick okay so from steve davis do you think there's a case to say customers are becoming more quality based on the delivery method of smartphones and apps. Initial delivery followed by regular updates to resolve bugs and add features. By stealth, it seems consumers are becoming attuned to buying into IPR delivery and con consumerism. Um, so I, I missed the first bit of that. Um, and yeah. can you just repeat it? Yeah, sure. Do you think there's a case to say customers are becoming more patient with quality? Um, I think, I think they're, they're understanding technology more. Um, I mean, if, yeah, if you were to speak to my father-in-law, he's the most impatient person. You know, his Wi-Fi wasn't working the other day and he wanted me to fix the world. But, it, you know, it, it's, it really is kind of, it's going to be the, the what is your customer market? You know, for, so for us at Dunelm, our primary customer is, is kind of middle age and above. Now, those people may not be as accepting of, you know, technology and, and you know, the, the, I've got to wait for an update, but that's cool. So it's really going to be driven by your, your customer in the, in the market you're in. So, you know, I think that that's something we always going to need to consider, but yeah, I think definitely, you know, customers will understand, um, you know, technology more as we kind of uh, have progress, but I don't think we can just assume that they're going to be more patient. Brilliant. Thank you, Stuart. Um, next question from Chris Henderson. What are the main challenges faced when trying to adopt a culture of quality shift left? 
and what can be done to help this transition easier? Um, so I think the biggest, so the biggest challenges for me are, it is, and it's going to be a bit, sound a bit cliche, right? But it is the mindset. And, and, and one of the things that we've worked really hard on is bringing in people with that mindset. So there is a, there is a, there is a phrase, if you can't change the people, change the people. And sometimes it is, as, it is as hard as that, you know, if you haven't got the right mindset, if, you're, if your organization is going on a, you know, on a, on a transformation, sometimes you just, you, some people aren't going to be right for that transformation. It's a horrible thing to say, but that's where the coaching side of it comes in really, really, you know, massively. And I think you, you, what you need to be able to do is, is, um, you know, look at quality and how you measure quality and how you then, um, you know, talk about that in, within your organization. And, you know, there's a, there's a great book. So I know a lot of people have probably read it uh, called Lead, um, this, this book here around, you know, leading quality. It just gives so many great examples where, you know, the conversations you have are really important on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the values, what we've done as a chapter is we've, we've created or we're creating values and principles that we want to talk about and, and champion on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, it's not just say me in, in the head of role trying to have these conversations, but we're doing it in the teams. We're doing it at every level possible. And it, 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 it can be a real slow, slow process, but it is, it's really trying to, you know, shift those mindsets of, you know, um, quality is everybody's responsibility and, you know, and understanding the impact of what we have on our customers if it's not good enough. Um, and it's also understanding what, what is, what is good enough as well. Um, and, 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 you know, again, it comes back to understanding the customers. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Um, next question from James McKay. How have you got on with influencing and training developers that quality really needs embracing by this group to have any hopes of delivering a quality product? Yeah, uh, this is, this is always a, a, a difficult one. I think it's the biggest challenge is I think when, um, if you don't, if, if you're lucky enough that you've got at least one engineer in your team that understands or wants to do this, that's a real win. If you've got one engineer that can kind of champion it and start and start, you know, encouraging others or at least showcasing and leading by example, that's a massive win. We're going through this a little bit at the moment with some of our teams. Uh, some are just some of our engineers are just just like all over this. They, I don't even need to talk to them because it's just ingrained in how they think. Whereas there's other teams where we just got to nurture them a little bit more um, and, you know, kind of not force them into anything, but just kind of um, talk to them about, you know, the benefits of doing certain things at certain times. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of this is, is really about just collaborating better as well. So, you know, and, 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 un and again, again, having empathy, for, for your engineers, if you can build empathy for your engineers and actually understand engineering and the challenges those guys go through, that can really help. Um, so I mentioned earlier about, I've had a lot of conversations with some of our engineers that are all over the, the, the engineering side of it and the, and the automation, they love it, you know, um, but they're asking me now, Stu, now we've got all this automation, can we stop doing exploratory testing? So I'm like, no, you can't. You know, the, the idea is you can do more of it. It's amazing, right? Biggest benefit of automation, exploratory. So, and it's trying to educate them in those kind of things as well. And, you know, one of the tech leads came up to me and said, I don't really understand what exploratory testing is. You know, can you kind of, and we, what we've done is we've um, created guilds. Um, so we've got a quality engineering guild where we talk about this stuff a lot and have uh, sessions around it. Um, and, and, you know, that's open to the organization. That's open to, to, to the world. Um, and we can try and keep, you know, keep that um, constant discussion and education going. Um, it's, it's, there's always going to be challenging challenges with this, but it's just trying to get in those champions uh, and, and from within. Okay, I'm just going to squeeze this last question in, Stu, because this um, prompted quite a big discussion in chat um, around the no bugs. So um, the base of the, the group says, do you believe in no bugs or is there a case for some bugs for what wasn't seen, considered, foreseeable and wasn't in scope for the current sprint, i.e. is there a case for underscore some bugs underscore? Um, so let, let's face it, right? There's always going to be bugs um, in terms. But what my kind of approach to this is, I don't, I don't believe a bug is a bug until it's in production. Now, 
up until that point, it's just work in progress. Now, how you how you differentiate and how you manage that is really kind of you know down to the team. If if it's something that wasn't thought about within the scope of the story, then for me, that isn't a bug. That's you know that's that's feature related, and therefore that either comes in as a, a late change to your story, which is never great, or it's another story. Uh, you know, because that is feature development. If it's if it's a change in um, in the actual functionality or, or the feature you're delivering. So, you know, I get, you know, I, I'm, I, in terms of in, within a sprint, obviously, you know, looking at and, and how you measure, you know, um, the success of a, a, a piece of, of, of code or a feature or a product, you know, it's, it's based on whether it's meeting the, the, the criteria that's your scenarios or, you know, your acceptance and, you know, for me, having a conversation is, is far more powerful than raising a ticket in Jira and then just handing it off to somebody to get them to fix. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to really determine, are your stories up front had enough investment, understood, and you know, um, you know, you know, worth, are ready to, to, to be delivered? Um, so, so you know, it's it's a controversial thing, right? It's not all teams like it. Whenever I've raised it before, you know, people are a bit like, "Whoa, hold on a minute." Um, but it is a, it's it's something to try. Um, but again, you have to be a bit you have to be a bit mindful of it and mature around it, and give the ownership to the teams to really manage it. Great, thank you very much, Chip. So we'll wrap it up there, guys. We're conscious, um, you know, we've hit one o'clock. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today. Um, there will be a lean coffee morning follow up this week, which I'll be posting at some point. Um, so have a quick, quick chat and wish you about that. But thank you very much. Please do all stay safe, stay care, and keep an eye on, on the meetup page for the next meal. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.